Hello, it's good to be able to talk with you today. We have a great friend to have a conversation with, David Stoll, Professor David Stoll, Dr. David Stoll, a, res a teacher at Middlebury College, but an anthropologist. And we had a little conversation to begin with and we thought, well, we'll start there. And that there's a difference between be becoming interested in anthropology and becoming an anthropologist. Is that right? Maybe, yes. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that as it happens for you? Because it's your story we want to hear. Uh, m m m most American high school students have no formal exposure to anthropology. It's not in the curriculum. Uh, most American colleges and universities did not have anthropology departments until the middle of the 20th century. Um, so it's something that you uh, really have to um, discover um, on your own at some point um, in your progression into higher education. I happen to be gobsmacked by anthropology at the University of Michigan in uh, 1971, and it was a it was a revelation to me because it's a really interesting um, cross section between the humanities and the social sciences. It's essentially an attempt to push Western social science out beyond the boundaries of Western society and apply it to societies in previous historical pe periods and, and societies that exist mm -hmm. outside the West. So this is something that um, uh, I, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was like a revelation um, when I was about 20 years old. Was it a, a, a class, a teacher, or a book? Uh, it was, it was, it was a what particular, was it, it was a particular class. I thought I was a, uh, I thought I was going to, um, major in uh, religious studies. I was interested in religion. Mm -hmm. I, was, I tried out the psych of religion. I tried out a couple of religion courses. It was the, uh, the anthropology course that was the, the broadest that opened up the, mm -hmm. the widest realms. Mm -hmm. And um, within a few years, uh, I was becoming more and more interested in Latin America. And so, after I graduated from uh, the University of Michigan with a Bachelor of Arts degree, which I thought qualified me to do anything, <laughs> my, uh, my education had imparted analytical confidence. I, uh, I, I headed to Latin America. I wanted to, wanted to do power structure research either on evangelical Protestant missions to Latin Americans or on U.S. aid organizations to uh, Latin America. I ended up putting seven years into studying evangelical missions to indigenous people, in mm -hmm. particular a group called the Wycliffe Bible Translators. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, after much chasing my tail around the tree, after too many months and years on Smith Corona and then IBM typewriters, I did produce a book of sorts about the Wycliffe Bible Translators and how it had gotten to Latin America and how it had gotten very controversial in Latin America. Mm -hmm. That was essentially my uh, induction into anthropology. So you produced a book? I produced a book at too early an age without enough guidance okay. and without enough maturity. It is readable. but Fishers uh, of Men? It, it was called... Um, uh, Fishers of Men or Founders of Empire, uh, the Wycliffe Bible Translators in Latin America. I started out with a very critical attitude toward uh, the missionaries. Um, anthropologists, as a rule, uh, have a different approach to indigenous people than missionaries do. Missionaries, pretty much by definition, want to introduce indigenous people to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Anthropologists, as a crude generalization, are defenders of indigenous belief systems. So there's sort of a cats and dogs, mm -hmm. anthropologists versus missionaries. Um, it, 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 there, there are, there are uh, pre predictable uh, disagreements between the two professions. 
in practice, um, it gets very interesting because missionaries typically need to know anthropology to 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 have any chance of mm -hmm. uh, building a church among indigenous people, and. Anthropologists, many of us soon discover that uh, number one, uh, missionaries are going to hang around an indigenous community a lot longer than we are. Right. Uh, number two, uh, some of them are going to learn the language much better than we do. And number three, those missionaries might understand indigenous people mm -hmm. uh, better than we do. So in actuality, uh, the relationship between the two is not as conflictual as you might expect. Mm -hmm. But in any case, uh, anthropology is conceptually a very ambitious field. Uh, we, we try to apply anthropology to any and everything. This is, this is the kind of anthropology that was my entree to the profession. Mm. Uh, 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 say something more about it's uh, pursuing all these different options. I mean, how, how, how do you end up getting a focus? Oh, well, you don't necessarily get a focus. I mean, that, <laughs> oh, okay. that is something that you achieve through experience. But essentially, what anthropology comes out of historically uh, is um, Western colonization of non-Western societies. Mm -hmm. um, Colonization, imperialism goes back far, far before there was a West. But um, the first anthropology that we really know about that is firmly recorded consists of Europeans and Americans with what we would call essentially an Enlightenment education, um, reflecting uh, the thinking of Western intellectuals of the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Uh, being brought into contact with Africans, Asians, Americans, Oceanians, um, as, as European power centers take over these societies. And then Western intellectuals essentially getting into a debate over um, is, 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 is how Africans lived before we showed up, is it, is it better or worse? Than, mm -hmm. than how Europeans live. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's always been a comparative project, uh, always focused on understanding what humanity is like outside the boundaries of common sense as understood in Western societies. So That's how it all originated. So, so is it, um, does it call for uh, real appreciation of history? Oh, what we ended up learning, um, there's a long debate over the role of history in anthropology. Essentially, in the early 20th century, uh, anthropologists seeking to carve out a stable location in the division of labor in university faculties mm -hmm. tried to say, we're different than history. We're not really interested in history. Uh, we're focused on culture. Mm -hmm. We'll leave history to the historians. After one or two generations of that, essentially my generation in anthropology, the people who came into the discipline in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we realized that was a complete mistake. And so we, we reversed course. And so uh, history is now not just welcome in anthropology, um, n no, no anthropologist in his right mind would argue that, 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 that we could get along without history. Mm -hmm. We absolutely have to happen. Have they done that to happen. before? I mean, has that been a basic premise oh, of anthropologists? Uh, 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 if, if, I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the history of you know, particular figures um, in the development of Western thought about non-Western societies, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 almost always, we might be able to come up with a, with a few exceptions. Um, uh, individuals contributing to what we now call anthropology were very, very interested in the history of the peoples they were visiting. They didn't necessarily have much access to it because typically uh, uh, 
uh, anthropology was created in places where there was very little in the way of archival evidence. Um, they were trying to figure out, for example, they, they arrive in Hawaii, they have a Hawaiians to talk to, uh, they can talk to colonial officials and missionaries, but there's no, there's no archive of Hawaiian history because Hawaiians were not keeping history the way, they were mm -hmm. not keeping records the way Westerners were. So the history has had to be pieced together uh, in a bunch of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, we get history out of archaeology, we get history out of scouring colonial archives. For example, if a Dutch sea captain showed up in, in the Hawaiian Islands in the 1750s, we, we send somebody into the archives to, to come back with whatever that sea captain recorded about his trip. Mm -hmm. um, we now have genetic evidence. Um, and so migration history of oceanic peoples across uh, the Pacific, uh, the migration of the Polynesians into Hawaii, we now have uh, genetic evidence about that. So all of that uh, is, you know, being, being we, we have a historical record that's being created through the latest techniques. Yeah. So, sounds like there is both a, uh, a pursuit of dealing with uh, others in the field or related fields and um, having both respect and appreciation. And then there's also this question of uh, what do the peop people who are the common people, right? what do they know? What do they make of all this? And what are they, yeah, how do, what, what kind of sense do they make of this? Uh, Talk, talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, thus far, I've talked about uh, the struggle of Westerners uh, to understand uh, the people they're colonizing. Um, that's obviously a power relationship that we're uh, now increasingly conscious of in anthropology. And so... Um, What's happening now is, um, you know, quite a bit of, of, of interest on the part of people who were being studied a couple of generations ago mm -hmm. to become, um, to acquire Western knowledge tools and become anthropologists, biologists, whatever. Where they live. Right. And yeah. so... Anthropology now is more complicated. Anthropology is not just uh, what um, Europeans or Americans not big, make thick of one. Books. Or, or uh, well, there's or, you know we do produce big thick big, books, thick but books, yes. but who actually has the time to read big thick books? The the audience for big thick books might be declining. Yeah. So um, well, that's in other fields too. I can. You know, I have I have I have colleagues who have uh, spent decades. Um, uh, working in the the formation of what you would call um, indigenous or local ethnographers. Mm -hmm. You know, is it possible to train um, kids in southern Mexico whose native language is Satsil Maya? They've, they've, they've grown up bilingually as Sotzil Maya speakers and they've grown up as Spanish speakers. They're, many of them are graduating from high school now. Um, many of them are engaged in urban professions. Uh, no small number of them have migrated to the United States. Is it possible to induct them into anthropology? Mm -hmm. um, whether that or not that's possible is actually a, a very complicated question. Yeah. Um, um, dedicating your life to anthropology is not the fastest way to earn a living okay. for yourself or your yeah. family. Uh, uh, there are much faster ways than anthropology. A, a question that comes out of that for me is do, they, do the people who are working in the tools and the technology and the, the, the literature and uh, you know, all, all the intellectual things, do, do, 
are they now more open to be members of a team uh, than to do it by themselves. I always had this feeling when you're dealing with an ar archaeologist mm. that an archaeologist is this person who has a hat on mm. and who has a pick yep. and uh, and operates pretty much alone. So uh, is, is there teamwork in, well, in anthropology? I think you've given us some television imagery of what an anthropologist looks like. Uh, to, the, to the eternal regret of Every archaeologist I've ever met, yeah, yeah. the most famous archaeologist in the world is now Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones. Okay. Hollywood and the media popularize imagery of different professions. You know, um, you know think, about, think about Hollywood imagery of policemen and how that compares to actual policemen. Mm -hmm. Think about Hollywood imagery of uh, medical doctors and how that compares to actual medical doctors. Right. Um, actual archaeology um, is has always been a team effort. You know, whoever's standing in front of a television camera and making out to be an important person in any period of time has always had a lot of people behind him. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Even if even if the the focus is on one individual. So, for example, how on earth can you excavate a site without lots of very careful, very slow-paced excavation yeah. by people who know what they're doing? Right. You, 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 you can't excavate a site with a pickaxe. You can, you, can, you, can, you can rob a tomb with a pickaxe, okay. and many tombs are, have been robbed with pickaxes, those are not archaeologists. Right. Um, right. Anybody who goes at a tomb with a pickaxe, I'm, I, I'm sure there's there's grave robbers who have PhDs. They have some images that but, are but floating they're, there. They're, they're, well, the, first of all, they're doing it in secret because that's illegal um, to rob a tomb. And mm -hmm. second of all, if they have a credential as a professional archaeologist, they're disgracing. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're bringing shame on their profession. Right. Uh, let me let me ask you about Guatemala. Sure. Uh, and maybe shift to to uh, you. You've been connected to Guatemala for how long? Uh, I actually paid my first visit in 1975. Okay. But I did not speak Spanish, and I was simply a visitor, struggling to learn Spanish. I would say uh, that the first time I visited Guatemala, that I would have been capable of a coherent conversation was probably 1978. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long time. It's been a long time. And, and you've done a number of projects there. Can you talk about some of the uh, projects that you've worked yes. on? Yes. Uh, I keep coming back to the same country with a constantly evolving topic. I, I started out um, interviewing uh, Guatemalans who had participated <clears throat> in the formation of the Wycliffe Bible Translators. Mm -hmm. Even before anybody had dreamed up the name of the Wycliffe Bible Translators, there were Guatemalans working with the missionary who started the Wycliffe Bible right. Translators. Right. I actually got to meet some of his, um, some of the people who worked for him in the 1970s. Hmm. They had been working with this guy in the 1920s and they were still alive in the 1970s. I got to oh talk to gosh. them. It was quite a privilege. Um, I uh, came back to Guatemala a few years later because Guatemala was in the middle of the Civil War uh, between a right-wing U.S.-backed government and between a Cuba, Cuban-backed revolutionary movement um, in the power struggles uh, that defined the Civil War. Power had been seized by a born-again Protestant army general. So mm -hmm. Guatemala actually had <laughs> the first evangelical Protestant dictatorship in Latin American history. Right. This was a novelty. Um, I managed to hang around for five months uh, as a not very successful uh, uh, journalist stringer. I didn't manage to get much published, but I did get to talk to a lot of people. Uh, the the, the born-again dictator did not last very long. Um, mm -hmm. He was very religious, and his religiosity offended his fellow army officers. So oh, yeah. this particular born-again 
army dictator only lasted about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. But that got me uh, much more familiar with Guatemala uh, than I had been before. And so five years later, <clears throat> when I was in graduate school in anthropology and needed to pick out a place to do field work, I went back to a place I had visited very briefly in 1982 and 1983, mm. a, uh, in a Shilmaya town called Nebak, mm -hmm. N-E-B-A-J. And it's Nebak that I've kept coming back to uh, for the last 40 years. Oh. First visits in 1982, and then you know, much more frequent visits from 1987 onward. Um, Nebak is such an interesting place that I just hang around and every five or ten years a new subject rolls into view. So I stay in the same place and I get going on a different kind of project. Okay. That's, that's, that sounds fascinating to be able to go back to a place. I've thought about a couple of places you know, that I'd like to go back to mm. uh, but have but have passed on, you know, and kept, kept moving. Uh, so, so have there been, I'm sure there have been changes, but then there's also been non-changes, uh, you know, and things haven't changed. So kind of, where is it Guatemala in that regard? Change, not change? Uh, what hasn't changed is that uh, Nebak and a couple of nearby towns are um, the territory of Ishil Mayas. Mm -hmm. Ishil Mayas are one of about <clears throat> 20 odd different Mayan language groups mm -hmm. in Guatemala. They're a mid sized Mayan language group. They're somewhere between 100 and 150,000 people who speak Ishil Maya as their first language. Mm -hmm. They've They've been they've they've they they've been in these in these valleys for something like two thousand years, maybe another five hundred yeah. years. They've been there a very long time. Um, the archaeological remains in the area, the the tombs that have mm -hmm. all been plundered um, by grave robbers. Those are the the tombs of their their ancestors. Uh, they're still the predominant language group, and they're still running their own affairs. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Guatemala is sufficiently democratic to have a, I would call, um, surprisingly healthy democratic system at the local level. Uh, uh, no single group has a total power lock on the town hall. Um, there's genuine electoral competition. Uh, the electoral competition is nonviolent, at least at the level of homicides. Hmm. This is a relatively nonviolent corner of Central America. Uh, the homicide rate is low for Central America. Uh, they're, they're fairly strong uh, family structures. I would call this a wonderful place to be a child. Huh. Uh, there, there are lots of children. It's a rapidly growing population growth. And it's a, it's a great place to be a kid. Um, any kid has older siblings or cousins or neighbors. Um, you see groups of kids playing together in houses out in the street. It's a great place to be a kid. Are, are there people that you remember, like, and that when you go back that you see again? Or, oh, yes, or are sure. You, sure. Uh, but you're you're also one of I, I, one of the gifts you have is that you have this appreciation for looking at the the the, old, the overall picture and this the scheme and the uh, that whole patterns there. I mean, I just love to listen to that because mm. it shows it shows how you see it in a in a yes. bigger context. Yep. And then how you make it work. So. Uh, so you're, that, that has changed, too, or, or has it stayed Well, the same? what's changed, what hasn't changed, this, well, yeah, is, what an, has changed? this yeah. is an Ashil Maya town. Um, it's not going to stop being an Ashil Maya town anytime soon. That's a, that's a healthy Mayan language. Not all of the Mayan languages are healthy. This one is healthy. Kids are learning Ashil Maya from the cradle. What has changed completely is the way of life. 
Um, when I first showed up here in the early 1980s, we'll ignore the war. We'll just forget about that. We may not have yeah. time to talk about it. Uh, most of Shields made their living growing corn and beans on steep hillsides. Mm -hmm. um, now, 40 years later, the number one industry in the area, and for much of Guatemala, the number one industry is exporting their labor to the United States. Exporting, what, what exporting, is that exporting labor to the United States. I, I would not know how to calculate what percentage of the Nebak labor force is now in the United States, mm -hmm. but it could easily be 25%. Hmm. I cannot defend that uh, right. figure statistically, but, but there's an enormous amount of migration up to the United States that has gobsmacked the Ashils themselves. Mm -hmm. They themselves are surprised and, by it. They're constantly debating and it. And are these in technical jobs or these or are all way? these? This, this is almost this is almost entirely illegal migration. Okay, it's almost entirely based on families in Guatemala borrowing large amounts of money mm -hmm. against their their houses and property in order to pay smuggling networks to send their youth. To the United States. Okay. That's what it's based on, and they're entering the bottom of our labor market. Uh, and they are, you know, this has been going on for about 25 years now, just from this town. Right. And yeah. so now you're starting to see upward mobility, but it's severely constrained by uh, the illegality of almost right. all the movement. Right. Right. I, I, you just answered one of the questions I had, and that is uh, that we, uh, um, I was going to say, uh, it seems to me we, we very hear very little about Guatemala I, in, in terms of the, the countries that are in that area, uh, what gets into the public news. Is, Not that, very is much. that a right perception? Or, or No, we don't hear a whole lot about it, but um, uh, there are. It's 25 like or 30 jurisdictions yeah. south of the Rio Grande. So, okay. but sort of by the nature by the nature of the power imbalance between mm -hmm. one hegemonic power in the Western Hemisphere and 30 other countries that are less yeah. powerful, by definition, you're not going to hear much about most of them. Okay, we're we're going to. Getting, we're getting close to the, the time. It's going by fast. Uh, so is there something, a couple of things you want to just leave with us to help us all become uh, students of, of, of life in the way you're pursuing students oh, of life? Oh, well, I guess, my, I guess my generic advice to people who have the great good fortune to travel um, whether your good fortune is to be able to visit your relatives in Kentucky or, you know, whether you have the wherewithal to uh, visit Latin America or Europe or wherever, my, um, my suggestion would be to think about going back to places you liked every year and getting to know people and uh, brewing into one location or maybe one or two locations if you're on some kind of seasonal cycle. I think it's, you know, it's wonderful to you know, run around Europe. Um, it's wonderful to do multi-country tours, but most people on multi-country multi tours end up with the, it's Tuesday, this must be Belgium. Yeah. And so, you know, some people might enjoy that, but there's a lot to be said for going back to the same place. Yeah. And if you keep going back to the same place, you'll get to know people a hell of a lot better yeah. than if you're just running to a new location every that time. That is so good. I, uh, that's a good way for us to pause this conversation. We may have some others. If, okay, uh, we can do certainly. That. Um, we're very glad to, to be able to have this time, and we, you'll be able to see this uh, on M MCTV. Uh, and um, we thank you for coming today. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to talk to you. Okay. Thank you. Good.